Warning. This podcast contains material that may or may not be considered appropriate for the average Trumptopian household. Listen at your own risk to unauthorized and explicit reading. On today's show... Disclaimer. All rights to literature referenced are retained by appropriate entities, and no infringement is intended. The reading of any and all literary materials referenced herein is done expressly for the altruistic purpose of genuinely facilitating the species-wide pineal gland activating third eye opening transcendent spiritual enlightenment of all of humanity. Any and all opinions expressed herein are exclusively those of the imaginary talk show host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. And now, Brace yourselves for unauthorized and explicit readings. On today's show, Logos. Thank you for tuning in, friends. Sorry about that little mess up there at the beginning. I forgot the exact landscape of this introduction, in part, tragically, I think you would agree, I haven't done it in a long time. So I wasn't sure if there was a big long gap there where I had planned to leave myself room to be like, on today's show, these things. And then, you know, let the the tape keep rolling into the warning. I didn't know how much time I had, so. But today, let us talk about Logos. Some people think they know what that means. Some people have no idea what that means, never heard of it. Some people land right in the middle, right? I was one of those kinds of people in turn throughout my life. So to make sure we start off on a solid footing, let's go to Wikipedia, right? Unless you have a gnarly, hardcore proofed and fact-checked and verifiable conspiracy theory that Wikipedia is uh, somehow evil and nefarious. I think that in a normal sane world, and I know that's really difficult to say out loud given who the president is, but in a normal and sane, sane world where all other things taken into account, there are still places uh, on the internet where the information can be mostly trusted fingers crossed, knock on wood, I think Wikipedia is one of them, right? And if I'm wrong, well, we're so much more fucked than we realize it doesn't matter. But I can tell you uh, that from long before the internet existed, I have come across this information and can confirm to you that it's in really, 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 really old, musty old books. And okay, were those controlled by the evil cabal? Perhaps, 60, 40, who knows? But for some reason, this information has persisted throughout time, as you will shortly see. At least human history of time. And uh, worth of time, right? And uh, it has remained consistent unto itself if you look hard enough. Now, mind you, there are plenty of attempts, as always, to water it down, misdirect you, the reader and understander, and give it a spin. But if you burn past the nonsense, you see a strong, solid foundation. Logos. Ancient Greek. From Lego. Isn't it funny that Lego and Lego toys? Mm, Weird. But, uh, so this word's root originates from an ancient Greek word, L E with a dashy, uh, you know, uh, what are those called? Um, accent mark. 
G O with a flat accent mark, which literally means quote I say end quote. Logos is a term in Western philosophy, psychology, rhetoric, and religion. Each of those are a link on the Wikipedia page so that those of you, any of you out there who are not familiar with those terms, no shame, click on it. Go to the Wikipedia page. Join me, wikipedia.org, wiki slash logos, L-O-G-O-S. No one from Wikipedia is paying for this show. This is a true and genuine, I think they're probably closest to the truth in terms of no one evil and nefarious is fucking with them, I hope, kind of websites for looking into what words mean and what things supposedly happen when. Depending on your degree of, like, they control all the media conspiracy theory, you may think this is malarkey and, you know. But let's just, like I said, in a sane world, let us continue. Uh, and, can, you know, let us, let us put a pin in each of them. Philosophy, psychology, rhetoric, and religion. Because even people as uh, well-read as myself often create the folly of believing that we understand those terms and then we realize we really don't anymore because we've let our own mind hijack and edit our understanding, right? Because not only do we have to worry about people fucking with the information out there, we have to contend with the fact that our own mind fucks with the information inside. But that's another episode. I digress. Logos is a term in Western philosophy, psychology, rhetoric, and religion, derived from a Greek word variously meaning, quote, ground, quote, plea, quote, opinion, quote, expectation, quote, word, quote, speech, quote, account, quote, reason, quote, proportion, and, quote, discourse. Now, why did I go to such lengths to really feature each of those words? I don't want to blur past them. Some of them may seem like grounds for dismissing any theory based on this word, right? Any, any conclusions made on this, uh, about this word, using this word, can be thoroughly rejected because one of its root meanings is opinion. Now, that's a very elitist opinion to have, in my opinion. But we'll come full circle, I think. Let's just keep our eyes open and understand that the word cloud, as identified here, has many layers of significance if you let the words mean things in relation to other words. But let's just get through the sentence, or through this little paragraph here. Wikipedia continues, and I am reading from them on my, uh, you know, computer screen here. It became a technical term in Western philosophy, beginning with Heraclitus. Heraclitus. Her Sorry, that name always makes me giggle because it's just so overtly, you know, like, it reminds me of... Uh, of uh, Monty Python's uh, Life of Brian, and when he, Brian, gets arrested and brought before Caesar, who's got a speech impediment, there's some prolonged scene about his friend whose name is Biggeth Dicketh. Do you think his name, Biggeth Dicketh, is funny? And so on and so forth. So Heraclitus, 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 Heraclitier, clitoris, um, Heraclitoris, uh, is a Greek, <laughs> it just makes me giggle, and makes me fuck up my own podcast. But this dude from Greece, presumably a dude, could have been a woman, with a name like, so similar to clitoris, who knows, right? Weak joke, sorry. Transgenderism is not something to make fun of. It, by the way, if I may really quickly, there's quite simple and obvious evidence that generally speaking, in terms of organic, natural expression, the human genome has indeed always produced individuals that are 
transgendered and multi-gendered. But put a big fucking pin in that. That's a whole nother episode. I don't want to get lost in that rabbit hole now. I'm, not, I'm neither endorsing nor criticizing the idea, the experience, the personal uh, phenomenological history of someone's life or the way in which that word is being used because it's being used in many ways uh, today in postmodern society. We'll have to do a whole fucking episode on that. But, uh, but yes, um, Monty Python does a lovely scene. If you've never seen Life of Brian, folks, seriously, you're missing out. It's still incredibly relevant and should light a fire under your ass about like critical thinking about reality and how it works. But I digress. Uh, it's also very funny. So, let me just start that sentence over again and try not to hit the speed bump amicably, jokingly mispronouncing this ancient Greek person's name. It became a technical term in Western philosophy, beginning with Heraclitus in 535 to 475 BC, which, by the way, is either before Common Era or, for those of us who remember the good old Catholic churchy days of Catholic education, before Christos or before Christ. Or before Jesus, of course, they would never change it to BJ because that would just instantly turn into, you know, obvious shenanigans of a sort of junior high level of... I digress. So, 475 years before Jesus was born, this Greek philosopher was using the term logos, which is what this episode's about, as a principal order, uh, to define, rather, as the word logos meant in his usage, quote, a principle of order and knowledge. A principle. That should be capitalized. Like, it's, a, it's like the important kind of version of the word. You know how they say uh, in postmodern media when they're talking about nuanced distinctions between party and philosophy... There's like capital D democracy and little d democracy or capital R Republican and little r Republican and so forth and so on about different things. Okay. I think that should be a capital P principle, capital O order and capital K knowledge in my humble opinion. If I were the type of person to be such a busybody and, and, and you know, sufficiently confident in my level of understanding of all the things, I would edit that. But I'm not going to. Let us proceed really quickly and let me wrap up the Wikipedia portion of this episode and move on to the really meaty stuff. Wait for it, folks. It gets better. <clears throat> Ancient Greek philosophers used the term in different ways. The sophists used the term to mean discourse. Aristotle applied the term to refer to the reasoned discourse or the argument in the field of rhetoric and considered it one of the three modes of persuasion alongside ethos and pathos. Pyrrhonist, Pyrrhonist, Pyrrhonist philosophers use the term to refer to dogmatic accounts of non-evident matters. The Stoics spoke of the logos spermaticos, the generative principle of the universe, which foreshadows related concepts in Neoplatism. Now let's stop there. Each of those sound really, really different. Unless you apply a fractal understanding to it. And that perhaps they were exploring different ways of describing the ways in which the generative principle of the universe can be both experienced and made manifest by us, the talking monkeys. But let's not get too lost. Um, the reason I wanted to do an episode about this is because there's multiple places where this gets discussed in terms of things I've encountered in my own research uh, in my life. And over the decades, the many long decades of this amateur, by all means, go ahead, poop on that word if you want, but I'm quite proud to say that no one's ever paid me to do this research. 
did it for myself. And yes, it's limited by the means that I've had to get my hands at books. Um, but at least I think I've found books uh, written by people who've gotten their hands on even harder to get a hold of books. And yeah, it takes a little bit of a leap of faith uh, to trust that they're not just puppets for the, you know, a system of oppression. But one of my favorite books, written by one of my favorite authors of all time, who, like, if I were a struggling uh, survivor of some post-apocalyptic, you know, uh, dystopic world, I w and I still had these three books, I'd be like, this is the books that we should build the world around. Not a religion, but our we should root our society and our, you know, the way we figure things out in this book and these two other books because I believe them to be very, very true, more true than most of the other books out there telling you that they're true and you should believe this or that. Uh, and uh, because I don't think I've ever done it before, I'm going to read to you the the very one of the pages at the very back of this book, which is one of my favorite books ever. In fact, it might. I'm checking here to see now, live on the air. This is the back cover. This is that first page behind the back cover. This is the next page. These are all blank. There's nothing on here. I really love the texture and the tone they've become. I love books because they're real, right? and I could hold them. Okay, this is the very last bit of text in the entirety of the volume as it is printed, about the author. Karen Armstrong spent seven years as a Roman Catholic nun. After leaving her order in 1969, she took a degree at Oxford University and taught modern literature. She has become one of the foremost British commentators on religious affairs and now teaches at the Leo Back College for the study of Judaism and the training of rabbis and teachers. She is also an honorary member of the Association of Muslim Social Sciences. Her published works include Through the Narrow Gate, Beginning of the World, The Gospel According to Woman, Holy War, and Muhammad. This is the final page of the New York Times bestseller, and of course, for many people who might be listening, that seems to automatically debunk it as anything believable because if it's in any way, shape, or form attached to, acclaimed by, reviewed by the New York Times, then it must be fake news. But I don't think any of that stuff is true to that extreme that the most rabid proponents of it would want anybody to believe. But that's a whole other episode, right? Again, assuming a sane world where the craziest thing going on is Trump trying to get away with what he's getting away with, and everybody else being basically trolled by either Trump, Russia, China, or any of the nefarious independent gray uh, hackers that are out there just trying to shit, throw noise into the mix for the sheer shits and giggles of distraction and confusion and instigation of chaos, um, you know, we can rely on certain things as being well-researched well-written, and as close to that given author's understanding of the truth as humanly possible. And I would say to you, having had this book for a very long time, having read it questioningly, and having tried to follow up and find flaws in it through verifying in other places, this book stands up there. I, I put it at that honor that if, I, if, if the whole world were to turn to me after an apocalypse and be like, you, Mr. Zeppo, you were, we were listening to you before the apocalypse, and now here we are. We're survivors of the apocalypse. You're 112 years old. Tell us, what book should we read? You're the only one that has books. And I'd be like, read this one. Legit. Like, question it every word of the way, mind you, but read it. Deeply think about it. Don't just consume it and say, oh, okay. I digress. The title is, for those of you who may or may not already realize, A History of God. The 4,000-Year Quest of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, as written by Karen Armstrong. So I wanted to read that just as a reintroduction of uh, this brilliant mind, 
known to the world as Karen Armstrong, and uh, the book itself. For those of you who are like, what is he doing? What is he talking about? It'll all make sense in the end once you catch up with yourself and all the other episodes. But uh, I wanted to now read really quickly what inspired me to do this episode today was that I was looking for... I had picked this book earlier in a moment of like, oh yeah, I haven't done an unauthorized and explicit readings segment in quite some time. I really ought to. I didn't know what to do, but I was like, I want to read from Karen Armstrong. I knew that right away. So I was thinking, where, how do I, do I do a little bit of random ass bibliomancy and pick three pages? I've already done an episode like that. In fact, I doubled down on that idea and did an episode, three sets of three, where I did three readings from three, you know, you know, three readings from three different books. Uh, so fractal numbers everywhere. But this time I was like, I'm going to let it tell me something deep by picking, by letting a word stand out um, and then looking for that word everywhere in the book, uh, which is a really fascinating way to revisit a book you already know well, especially one that is serious bona fides academics. This isn't a work of fiction, folks. This woman spent her life investigating the history of world religions in a way that you and I may only pretend to have done on the internet, right? Um, when arguing about religion on the internet. But this woman did it. She lived this life. And she's got quite a bit of profound amount of research under her belt and quite some interesting things to say about everything. So let's find out today what, beyond that which is shared with us, and there's quite a bit more, by the way, folks. To zoom back over here to uh, Wikipedia. If you want to read more about Bogos, it's got a full-blown, like, 11 sections. Ancient Greek philosophy, Heraclitus, Aristotle's rhetorical logos, Pyrrhoists, the Stoics, and Is Isocrates logos. In Hellenistic Judaism, Philo of Alexandria, what he had to say. In Christianity, there's a version of Logos. In Neoplatism, there's a version of Logos. In Islam, there's a version of Logos. Jung's Analytical Psychology. We might pop that one open later to come full circle on this episode. By the way, this is one of the episodes, this is one of the segments where I don't worry about it running too long. If you think this episode is too long, hit pause, take a break, go smoke a bowl, come back and join me. Even if it takes you a couple days, don't fret. It's really worth it. Like, stick through all the way to the end. We might come back to Jung. There's also rhetoric, Rima, and other references. So, Wikipedia, go read it on your own. Uh, but here, on page 449, when I was like, let, let the book tell me what to look up, I was like, there's an index in the back, right? This is the page it popped. Like, I was flipping, and... I stopped here and I'm like, what page is this? Index 449. We've got L's, K's. And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm like, Logos. Ah, of course. Um, and let me just read you what it says. Really, and this is, of course, an index listing, right? Um, and mind you, I love this word for many reasons because I've come to an understanding, and here's where it gets freaky, folks. A direct phenomenological experience. I can never pronounce that word as perfectly as I'd like to. A direct phenomenological experiencing of. Or I'm kooky crazy, right? Or I'm insane. Because I am a robot from the future. Who knows? Um, it's hard to tell some days. Logos. Word, comma, master plan. Page 89, 210, 237, then curiously, 403, and mind you, in prepping for the show, I looked at each of these and put a bookmark down so I can flip to them quickly, and on 403, I couldn't find it, but we'll see if we can get to it, find it when now on the air. And then also, so uh, the next bit, it says, Gnostic, as in from the Gnostics, I, I imagine. Page 95. And then, you know, comma, Jesus as incarnation of... Page 94, 109, 112, 129, 162. And then it says, philo, which is not philosophy, but the root word in, in its own meaning, philo, 69. Uh, and then it says, see also wisdom. So we might go through that, but I'm sure they'll connect us to it. Now, <clears throat> this is going to be an interesting ride 
through you know the pages of Karen Armstrong's book and I wanted to kick it off really quickly do I still have some tea thank God because I'm already my, my voice is already thrashed and we haven't even gotten through it I wanted there's a bit from the beginning oh Karen Armstrong in her own introduction says and I wanted to share with this you uh, this with you because I think it's worth like really sort of enjoying and savoring and understanding a bit because it's one of the cogs at the center of all the wheels of within wheels of the synthesis of theories that I'm trying to synthesize here. And I quote, Yet my study of the history of religion has revealed that human beings are spiritual animals. Now, there's, that's a loaded phrase, right? There's a lot we can unpack just from that. She goes on to say, though, indeed, there is a case for arguing that, and this is why I love Karen Armstrong, she's not some rhetorically, dogmatically obsessed authoritarian dictator of dogma from the institution of the Catholic Church, although she was at once a nun within that system, it gives her, like, the act, it, that gave her access to, like, the kinds of deep documents that we'd have to go file all kinds of paperwork just to want to have at some point in our lives. Um, and we probably wouldn't get it because the Vatican guards its paperwork pretty severely, right? But, so, but she, and what I'm saying is, in this sentence, she proves that she's not just a tool for the church, I don't think. And, and her credentials, right, from the back of the book, Remember what, I, what it said about her? Let's go back real quick because I think this is fascinating. You wouldn't expect a Catholic nun uh, to be teaching at a college for Judaism and the training of rabbis or an associate honorary member of the Association of Muslim Social Sciences. Right? Like, those three things are no happy together. They must fight and argue and kill each other, right? Uh-huh. Uh, of course not. I mean, this woman transcended the boundaries of organized religion because, I would personally argue, of her deep, profound understanding of the history of organized religion and probably a deep, personal, phenomenological experience of that which organized religion has failed to truly preserve, which is the individual connection to the true thing that is the divine. But I digress. That's all me speculating about it. In her introduction, she goes on to say, in a very astute and intelligent and trans transcending of the system kind of way, in case, uh, indeed, there is a case for arguing that homo, and I'm again quoting now, that homo sapiens, because religion and science fight each other and are wrong, one is wrong and the other is true, um, that no, here she is blending them, that homo sapiens is also homo religiosios, right? She's like, not afraid of science uh, is my insight there to that little sentence. And she believes in the very science-y idea that we are animals, spiritual animals. She goes on to say, and I quote, men and women started to worship gods as soon as they became recognizably human. Acknowledging and understanding that evolution is not a, a lie designed to destroy your faith in God. They created religions at the same time as they created works of art. That, of course, is a deep, profound thing that I can unpack a bunch of different ways, in which, especially in that it relates to the thesis or the point others have made that if God is a creator and God made us in God's image, what are we supposed to be doing here? Well, it should, I don't think, should be destroying and profiteering on that which we destroy, which is, if you really think about it with clarity, precisely what we do no matter where we go to do it, whether it's in war, whether it's in commerce, whether it's in you know, the way in which we conduct politics. But I digress. I'll wrap this up. This was not simply because they wanted to 
propitiate powerful forces, these early faiths expressed the wonder and mystery that seemed always to have been an essential component of the human experience of this beautiful yet terrifying world. There's a lot of people out there that are really quite ready and prepared to just burn the whole collection that we call um, organized religion down to the ground and throw it out, throw the baby out with the bathwater. But I think that this book, preeminent to most any other that I've read, of course, there are probably other ones that I have not read that make this point quite beautifully. But are they recent or are they as old as this one, right? I mean, not that this one's that particularly old, uh, but I digress, it's not, it's not a contest. The, the, her point uh, in her work is that, uh, you know, there's some meaning and some beauty and some profound truth in the systems that we call organized religion. And yes, also the critiques of them are valid because humans are humans and we do what we do and we are vulnerable to corruption. But let's leave that as a cliffhanger. Part one comes to an end here. Part two will resume momentarily. I just need a brief break and also want to break up the show so that even if it runs on into two and a half, three hours, it doesn't need to be a one big, giant, huge slog of a download or one slog of a listen. You've got a nice, tight goal, 30 some odd minutes, and you're done with this part one of this episode. Thank you for listening, my friends. Uh, do not disappear. I'm coming right back. And just to kind of make the end of part one interesting, I'm going to play you uh, that track from Gazuda and uh, their album Young Monet Chaplin that I forgot which track it is, but I've played it before. Here it comes again. <laughs> 